second to last week. Maybe do this next week. We'll be home free, at least until fall. So, for diving into our lessons for this week, just some updates and things about upcoming stuff. Um, you should have your um, what's it uh, your epistle paper should be wrapping up. It's due at the end of the of, of this current week, is April sixteenth. Be sure to get that in. All assignments, all assignments will be closed as of April 23rd. So any and all the participation assignments, any and all the, read, the reading journals, any and all of anything else that has been turned in, your epistle paper and everything else. All of that will be closed up on April 23rd. I will not be taking anything except barring extenuating circumstances. So you've got a week and a half. It's, you've got 10 days. It's April 13th right now. Remember that all of the participation assignments are able to be retaken even, even afterwards. So. Even if you take it and be late with it, it's better than having a zero if you haven't um, taken it yet. So get all of those things in, like I said, if you have extenuating circumstances, that's obviously different. I'm not just going to take it just because you've been lazy, though. Um, you need to have everything done before you enter into finals week. I'm not going to be a jerk and make you turn in a whole bunch of other stuff and study for my and study for other finals. So be sure to get all of that in. If you're having issues, if you're, if you're having you know, difficulties, that's another thing. I think most of us have worked out how to work Canvas at this point enough so that we can work it together. So you'll have two more participation assignments, the one for this week. One for next week, about the same as they've been for any of the others. Um, as far as the last uh, reading journal, I think with everything we have going on, I'm not going to mandate that. I'm not going to mandate you that, but I may go ahead and open it up as an extra credit opportunity. How many of you would be sitting here would be interested? Obviously, you don't have to do it. I can't make you do it. But if you do, if you turn it in, you might get some extra credit. The last reading journal. So, therefore, you know, you wouldn't be required to do it. If you want to do it, you're welcome to. And I'll just add those points to your overall total so that you lose your credit. Some of you may need it, some of you may want it. So, I will post that up then tomorrow, the next day, um, and put those details in um, on Canvas. All right. Sounds good. Uh, Father Straub, I have a question. Yes. Um, when are we supposed to have our presentations on our epistles paper ready? I'm finalizing the, the details for that. Uh, I'll probably have that, um, have you have that done by next week as well. But let's see, I'm gonna have those details and then um, put, put all of that, post all of it up for you um, on campus. How's that sound? Okie dokie. Mm -hmm. So I will, let, I will get all those details done and ready for you. All right. I'm not. I don't. I don't like to keep people in the dark, and I know you don't want to be in the dark either. So. Other questions? Other? Other? Um, anything coming up?
if I don't know if you even have to look at it yet, but it came up with a point for like the when we chose what a pistol we were gonna do. Let's look at that at the break and see what see what went what happened there. Okay. Um, listen, so that might that might be something. Maybe I misgraded or something like that. Might be something. Like that. Well, let's look at that um, during the break. We'll see if there are issues with any of that. Um, you know, if you go through and you feel you know you weren't graded right or whatnot, you feel free to email me. Let me know. I can make mistakes. I'm a human being. It happens. I know. All right. So we've spent the majority of our time in this class looking at the Gospels. What does the word gospel mean ultimately? Good news. Good news, right. What's the good news? Ultimately, yes. About Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, being from, born into the world, teaching, preaching, suffering, dying, rising from the dead. Yet there's obviously more to the New Testament than just the Gospels. And the Gospels are four of the 27 books. They're not the majority of the books. They're a good portion of the text, but they're not the majority of everything we've looked at. How is it that this gospel message, not necessarily the gospels themselves, how is it this gospel message begins to be spread and proclaimed around the world? That is where we go into the next book that we'll look at at least for this section. It's called the Acts of the Apostles. It is so called because this is the time period kind of immediately after the Gospels. Hence why, it's, hence why it is situated where it is in the, in the order of the New Testament. It comes after the, the Gospels because it happened after the Gospels. So who were the apostles? I don't mean a list, just a definition of the term. Who or what are the apostles? Uh, those closest to Jesus in the inner circle. Yeah. Part of Jesus in the circle? Yes. Church leaders. Church leaders? Yes. Any others? Other comments or questions or ideas or thoughts? The ones who were entrusted. Oh. No, many of them are just founders. That's about it. Though. Well, no, I mean, no. You're very much on the right track. I don't want to make you feel like you were wrong. No, very much church leaders, part of Jesus' inner circle. The biggest part, and this is why they are so called, from their name, apostolos, in Greek, which means those who are sent. Those who are sent to go forth and to do something. So these apostles, those who had been close to Jesus, had walked with him and seen all that he had done, are beginning to go forth with the conclusion of Jesus' personal presence on earth. We'll talk about that as we, as we begin this book. With Jesus leaving them behind, as it were, ascending into heaven, they go forth, they begin to proclaim this gospel message. They don't just do it though by words, they do it by actions as well. Hence, calling it acts of the apostles or actions or doings of the apostles. Now, we saw, we talked briefly about this corresponding 
to another one of the Gospels, to another one of the Gospel writers, and that is Luke. Luke and Acts are seen as kind of two, a two-volume work. And he writes the Gospel, and then he writes Acts to complement his Gospel, as it were. And there is you know, universe, near, near universal agreement that these two come from the same author. There may be argument about you know, the scholars of you know, whether it's Luke or not, but that they are from the same writer, the same author. As we talked about in, in doing our kind of gospels table, you know, a very educated Greek Christian, Greek speaking Christian, who's able to write you know, very well, very eloquently, at least for his place and his station in this world. Father Straub. So Acts is always said to come later, uh, afterwards, or, or kind of immediately following the Gospels, or sometimes maybe in conjunction. So it's said to be dated usually 70s to 80s. which is interesting because we can pretty much date when Acts, the, the Acts of the Apostles happens, the, its own inner chronology. So it, it's normally said to have picked up, as we'll read in the first thing, right away, you know, at the time that Jesus ascends, which is only a couple, a few days, a few weeks after his resurrection, it's about the year 33, and usually said to go for about a 30 year period to about the year 62, give or take a couple years. That was like published in the 70s, maybe? This is like when it was composed. Published is kind of harder to use since, um, what's the, you know, there's no printing presses back then. So, you know, you would have just written it all yourself or copied it. So this is kind of when it's composed, the normal date of composition. Sorry, Father Straub. Oh, yes, sorry, I didn't. So are you saying it was, Acts was dated 33 to 62 and it was composed? The events that happen the events that happened. The events that happened in, in the chronology of the Acts of the Apostles happened 30, in this period. 33 to 62, and then it yes. was composed in the 70s to 80s. It's, it's written, it's composed okay. between the 70s and the 80s. Okay. Um, and then also, I was going to say, like, in some of them, basically, like, what you were just saying is, they said with, like, uh, I think it was either Peter 1 or Peter 2, uh, that it doesn't sound like it was written. Some of them weren't written actually by some of those apostles. They were either followers of those apostles. Well, I said, we'll talk. We'll talk. We'll talk with that when we get to um, the letters themselves. So okay, yeah. So the Gospel of Luke, the Acts of the Apostles, are seen as kind of two volumes. Acts picks up kind of where Luke ends. And what does it start with? It starts with kind of recalling to whom Luke, the author, is writing and dedicating this work. Who was that individual? Who was that named individual? Theophilus. Theophilus. Who is this Theophilus? If a real person, just some wealthy donor. And this may be a way to reference them anonymously. This doesn't necessarily have to be a name. It could be a pseudonym. It's like we may use John Q or John Smith. But as we talked about before in looking at 
Luke's gospel. It could be more symbolic and indicate the reader who is meant to be one loved by God. Philus, loved, befriended. Theos, God, loved, befriended by God. So, Luke recalling everything that you know, had happened before, but leading into this time of the apostles. Why is this important? To begin to see how it is this gospel message begins to be, begins to transform those around it. How it is spread, how it is proclaimed, how it begins to be interpreted. Because it's during this time that we begin to see this nascent community of believers begin to turn their attention away from merely those who are like them, their neighbors, of the same race, of the same ethnicity, Jews, Judeans, to begin to turn to other peoples. Is this message, is this gospel only for them, or are others meant to hear it? And if so, well, how does that how does that entail or work in relation to everything they had known? being practitioners of the Jewish faith, the Jewish religion, the religion of their people. Now, we kind of start at an end point. We start with what is called the ascension of Jesus. Now, we, we kind of heard a little, we heard, we heard that briefly recalled in a couple of the other Gospels. What is this ascension? Well, recall that when Jesus rises from the dead, he does not rise as a ghost, or a phantasm, nor does he rise to die once more. This risen Jesus is now fully alive. But yet it seems he is not meant to remain in this world as it is now. And so it is 40 days after the resurrection, 40 days after Easter Sunday. What, should, what should automatically should come to mind when you see number 40? 40 days in the desert. Others? Noah's Ark, rain fell for 40 days and 40 nights. So 40 days after, so this period of sort of purification and preparation is normally kind of what 40 symbolizes. Jesus takes them outside of the city of Jerusalem and he is taken up from, from them, ascends, literally taken to ascend is taken up into heaven. He calls them, before he departs, before he is ascends, he calls them to wait for the, percent, for the promised gift, what he calls his Holy Spirit. Yes? Yes, the, the apostles. Uh, possibly maybe a larger group than just the apostles, but at the minimum, the apostles. But how many apostles? How many apostles did Jesus pick? Um, originally 12, one number at 11. Correct. Luke, in writing out Acts of the Apostles, talks about the fall of the one who brought about all that Jesus suffered, which ultimately led to his death, the fall of Judas. 
In Luke's recollection of this, Judas seems to buy a field outside of town. And the field seems to almost swallow him alive. Now, if he means some sort of miraculous event that the field eats him, or that he is buried out there after dying in some way is not clear. I thought he, uh, I thought he went, I forget which one it is that I read, but it, I thought he went and hung himself because he in, went in one of the other accounts, um, I can't remember which one at the moment, in one of the other accounts, he hangs himself. In Luke's account, this is the language that Luke uses. Okay. Whether that means, like I said, you know, he says that the field swallows him up. Okay. It's, not, it's not clear whether that means just he was buried out there after having died himself, after, after killing himself, or some miraculous event. It's not clear. Yeah, because the one I read said like that he went to go, after he realized what he had did, he went to go try to give the blood money back to the, right. to the Sanhedrins, and they didn't want to take it because it's unclean. They don't take blood money, right. so... He went and he hung himself to try to redeem himself, I guess, because that was the only way for portraying God. Um, and then it ends after there. Well, but and yet he never expressed any sorrow over what he did. He was sad about it, but he never expresses any contrition mm. in anything. Unlike Peter, remember, we looked last time, the end of the Gospel of John, Peter expressing his contrition. Lord, I love you, Lord. You know all things, you know I love you. So there are the 11 of the 12 who are still alive. Jesus takes them out. He is taken up from among them. He tells them to wait, to wait until the coming of the Holy Spirit. They spend the next nine days in prayer. In the midst of that prayer, in the midst of that preparation, they began to do, they seek to fill out their number. Now, re recognizing you know, their office is not meant to remain with them, they continue it. They seek to replace Judas with someone else. And it's very interesting the conditions that are given for who it is who can replace Judas, who can, who can become this, this successor of the apostles. We're still in the, just the first book of Acts. And Peter, remember, who's the head of it all? Peter. Peter stands up and says, we need to replace him. What does he need? One of the men who have accompanied us during all the time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, shortly after that ascension. One of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. This is what they see as their primary task. That in all that they are doing, they are bearing witness to the resurrection of Jesus. One who, though had not been, he had not been an apostle, he had not been chosen by Jesus, yet is being chosen by the apostles to replace this empty seat. They whittle it down to two men. They pray. They draw lots. And one man gets the gets the as we would say, the one man gets the short straw. And that is this Matthias. Who now replaces Judas. This, by the way, in Catholic theology, at least is seen as some of the justification for what the bishops are. They are successors of the apostles. They continue the work, the mission that the apostles had, bearing witness to the resurrection of Jesus. 
in all the actions that they do. So Jesus ascends. They endure these nine days of prayer. On the 10th day, a feast that is known in, uh, comes to be known in Greek as Pentecost or Pentecostes. which literally means 50th. On the 50th day after the resurrection, the apostles are at prayer. And Luke writes specifically, he says the apostles are at prayer with the mother of Jesus and some of the disciples. And that suddenly, Tongues of fire. A wind comes and tongues of fire are seen above or on the apostles themselves. They leave the room that they have been in for these past few days, these nine days, and they begin preaching. And what's incredible is that everyone can understand what they're saying. Everyone can understand what they're saying. Chapter two, some of the people in the crowd commenting, are not all these Galileans? Obviously a put down, saying Galileans are stupid. How is it we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews, Judeans, and proselytes, Cretans, Arabs. All of them understand the apostles. They understand it, what they're saying. Some think it's a trick. Some think they're drunk. Peter actually steps out and addresses that one first. These men are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. It's only 9 a.m. They've not had enough time to get drunk yet. No, there were no late night bingers at that time. They have not had enough time to do even that. It is very early in the morning. Peter, speaking as the head of the apostles, preaches to all of them, no, this is the promised gift of the Holy Spirit come down. Come down from whom? From this Jesus. This Jesus that you crucified. Now, I want, now think about this. This is 50 days after Jesus' resurrection. Not even two months away. So many of those who had, who had seen and heard Jesus be, be crucified and killed are still in this crowd. There are visitors from other places who were probably not there, but there are some. Peter then preaches and exhorts them. He exhorts them to belief. He seems to be emboldened by this Holy Spirit. You can, you know, turning their hearts, bro. Brethren, what, must, what shall we do? The crowd seems to cry out. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So it is this community of believers increases by a couple thousand on this day. 
the community of disciples and believers that are gathered together. This community will take on to itself, as we see in looking through the um, looking through the New Testament, they will call themselves in Greek the ecclesia, which means in general Greek, an assembly, a group gathered together. This will eventually get translated or transliterated in Latin and will replace the K's with C's. As this continues to be spread throughout Europe, other groups will hear it, especially Germans, who will try to translate it into their own language, Kirka. And then those greatest of language thieves, the English, will hear it and try to translate it into their own to become church. This is why the majority of Christian groups or denominations call themselves a church because they take to themselves that they are in some way linked to that original community, that original assembly of believers that is beginning to be formed as the Acts of the Apostles opens. That ecclesia, that assembly, community, church. You see this even in other Romance languages, for example. Spanish, iglesia. We, we English speakers more derived from Germanic than anything else, most of our words have more of a Germanic root. And that's very much true with church, Kirka. This so this community of believers, these followers of Jesus, and become this their own little assembly, their own little gathering group. How do they practice this belief that Peter preaches, this, all of this that they do? It comes in the midst of the beginning of this work. Chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. Four different things. There is the teaching of the apostles. So they are instructed, told, guided by these same apostles what to believe, what is the truth, who is this Jesus, what has he done. There is also fellowship. This isn't just a classroom. They don't all sit at desks with their little wax tablets, you know, chipping away for what the lesson is. They are a community. They bond together. Luke also mentions, he says, the breaking of bread and prayers. Not only does he mention 
these kind of four things that they do in common. But he mentions also how it is that they seem to live desiring to help one another. That they freely renounce themselves of their possessions, their goods, sell them and give it to the apostles to be distributed as needed. Note, not equally as needed, as people need it. These things, of course, Christians maintain in one way or another, and especially, of course, Catholics. The teaching that continues in, in all that the church proclaims. The fellowship that is meant to happen on the local level and even, in a sense, the universal level. The breaking of the bread, the Eucharist, the prayers, the various ways that we petition God for all that we need. Draw ourselves closer to this God through his Son, Jesus Christ, through his Holy Spirit. But what we're going to see in here is the spread of this community beyond its original place, beyond the city of Jerusalem, beyond even the greater province of Judea, remember. The Romans call this land Judea. We call it modern-day Israel, modern-day Palestine, depending on your politics or whatnot. We don't have time to get into that. Not the right class for it anyway. But beginning to grow, to spread, to bear witness to all of these things. But this does not happen without trials and persecutions. What is persecution? It is when there is an attempt to overthrow or to destroy the church in a certain place, in a certain area. To destroy and to stop the spread of the gospel message. This happens in a few different periods in the Acts of the Apostles. It happens a little bit right away. Those same Sanhedrin, those same chief priests and elders who condemned and denounced Jesus as a blasphemer, as a criminal, worthy of execution, try to stop this community of believers from acting Why? Because this has not been the only messianic group. You know what I mean by messianic? One that claims they are followers of a, of a, of a messiah, the anointed one. In this sense, seeing them as a political hero who's meant to overthrow all things. In all of this, remarking about one of one of the one of them, a man named Gamaliel, he says, before these days, Theodas arose, giving himself out to be somebody, had a number of men, but he was slain, and all who followed him dispersed. After him, Judas the Galilean, someone else different, drew away some of the people after him. He also perished, and all who followed him were scattered.
is Gamaliel says, if they're not the Messiah, if they don't, if they haven't followed the Messiah, but they followed instead just a naughty boy, they're going to collapse. They're going to just disperse and scatter and be no more. But if this is truly the work of God, this Gamaliel says, then who are we to stop? So it is that this gospel message, this community of believers, this ecclesia, continues to proclaim and preach, to spread the message. They grow so big, the apostles feel overwhelmed with all their duties. So they call forward. They, you know, and actually, there's a group of Hellenists or Greek speakers who complain and say, you know, you're not helping us. You're not doing, you know, the apostles are just exasperated. It's like, we can't do all these things. And some of these things are actually believe our position. True, a good leader needs to recognize they can't do everything. So they call forward and consecrate some men for service. The diakonia in Greek, D I A K O N I A. Professor Straub. Yes, sir. And what does that mean? It means a uh, service. Okay. Like in the sense of, you know, one who performs a service for another. Like, uh, kind of like, you know, butlers or, you know, kind of how we use the word servants in the classical way. That's what diakonia means. So these seven men are created diaconi, given this diaconia, this service to aid the apostles. Among them is one who seems to be filled with the Holy Spirit, seems to be a man of particular grace and disposition. A Stephen or a Stephanos in Greek. The community continues to grow, and again, it finds itself in hot water by the authorities. Stephen is arrested and is put on trial for spreading the name of the blasphemer, the criminal Jesus. Stephen begins to preach, to talk about the work of God in the midst of the patriarchs and all of that. But when he begins to tie it in to this Jesus that he has known and believed in, the crowd seems to go wild and they begin stoning him. And I mean literally, they, they pick up stones and they throw them at him to kill him. So it is Stephen perishes because of his witness concerning Jesus. This witness that he offers, or testimony as you might say in, in the more Latin ways, is called in Greek martyrios. This is, this is the root of the word that we get for a martyr, for one who dies for what they believe in. Why? Because it started with Christians who were willing to die and did die because of their witness, their testimony. That's, that's literally what it means in the original Greek. 
that they bear witness to the truth about Jesus. Stephen was put on trial, right? Yes. Uh, I thought um, the high priest couldn't um, do that. Like, sort of the crowd him. does it. It's not necessarily like the high priests go, well, go ahead and kill him. The crowd seems to be coming. There's a crowd that's gathered around. And the crowd seems to become so riled up that they cannot be contained. And then and this happens. Luke notes the presence in the midst of this stoning of Stephen of a certain individual that comes to be, that is known originally as Saul, Saul of Tarsus. As a result of the stoning of Stephen, stoning and death of Stephen, the pressure becomes too much for most of the apostles. They temporarily leave Jerusalem. They go out into like the neighboring areas, get away from the heat, not the literal heat, but just the friction that is coming because of the atmosphere. So going out and spreading the gospel more and more There comes another persecution rising up. A different priest, a different Sanhedrin, who are willing to do all they can to arrest and to try as much as they can hand over these Christians who follow the way as it comes to be called. They call it the way. The way of Jesus or just the way. And they send out this Saul who has become one of their best men. The Sanhedrin, I mean, I should make that clear. The Sanhedrin send out this Saul of Tarsus. They send him out so as to begin to arrest these Christians, these followers of the way, because they spread what they, they think is false, contrary to what the scriptures, the Torah and all that proclaim. Saul is on his way to the great city of Damascus in the north, modern day Syria still exists, still a major city. In the midst of his journey to Damascus, Saul is struck with a vision. He's overwhelmed by this vision of light. He sees a figure. He hears this figure. And this figure says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? Saul, almost being unable to see, cries out, you know, who are you? What are you? Who are you? The figure responds back and says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. In art, you will often see this as looking as if um, Saul has been struck off his horse. The text itself does not really say that. It doesn't often mention a horse anywhere, but more often than not in Renaissance art, you know, it was interpreted that a figure of that type would be riding a horse because he'd probably be some sort of noble figure. So you often see the conversion of Saul, as it's called. Him kind of falling off or already fallen off of a horse. 
Saul is blinded by this vision. I mean, in the literal sense, like he can't see. He is commanded by Jesus, this Jesus who speaks to him in a vision, to go into the next town and to find a certain believer there named Ananias and to be prayed over him. Ananias receives a, a message or a vision from Jesus to do this. And Ananias is kind of like, wait, you want me to do this for this guy? This guy's trying to find us and get us arrested and, and killed. Jesus says, I got something planned for you. Just do it. So it is that Saul is healed of his blindness and his eyes are truly opened to the truth. Saul will say later on that, that he has to take some time, even a few years, to truly reconcile and to understand what he has encountered and heard. But Saul begins to join these followers of the way to preach about this Jesus. And the people marvel at that, like, isn't this the same guy who was just trying to arrest them? What's he doing? Why is he doing this? Saul joins, meets the apostles, tells them his story. He is welcomed by the community, given some further instruction, and then sent forth to go and to continue his proclamation and his preaching. In the midst of that comes the beginning of this community's expansion beyond the people of Judea. This happens through the family of a centurion called Cornelius. A Roman centurion. And he's a commander of troops. He's a Roman. They, they did not allow any, they did, did not allow non-Romans to become centurions at this point. So he is truly not a Judean. He's not of the same people as, as Peter and Saul and the other apostles. Peter, before this happens, receives a vision. He is in the midst of prayer, and he sees God lower down a, a sort of cloth and kind of open it in front of Peter. And it contains almost every type of animal imaginable. Birds of the air, fish of the sea, land creatures, all types. And he hears a voice from heaven say, take and eat. Enjoy all of it, take and eat. Peter kind of holds back, he says, well, there are some animals that are unclean here, or not kosher. You may not have used the word kosher, but that same sort of idea. I can't eat these. They're not allowed. They're not permitted. And the voice says to him, do not call unclean what I have made. Do not call unclean that which I have made. Peter sees this vision three times. He then afterwards receives a messenger from Cornelius to come and to talk to him about this Jesus. Peter goes and in speaking and see, seeing how much of a God-fearing man Cornelius is and his family, he baptizes them all. He sees that passage, that, that vision is opening his mind to understand that. The church also sees that as understanding 
God permitting the consumption of all creatures. So this is why Christians can enjoy bacon. All good. Not saying you have to, not forcing you, but this is why you can do that. It'll come back. This baptism of Cornelius by Peter becomes a bit of a controversy at that point. You know, they've been working with their own people, fellow Judeans. So this is the first time that they're distributing and, and doing these actions, these prayers, and all of that with non-Jews, non-Judeans. So it is then Peter talks to all of them, explains his vision, and explains how he interprets it. All are amazed and all agree. God has called these Gentiles, they are often known, the non-Jews, non-Judeans. God has called these Gentiles to himself as well in Jesus. We then, in continuing in the Acts of the Apostles, we then begin to interchange between two of the apostles. Obviously, we've been hearing a lot about Peter, but we're also beginning to hear more and more about this Saul, who takes on a Greek name, Paul. Paulos. We begin to hear more and more about Saul going out on his on his own kind of missionary journeys and beginning to proclaim this this good word that he has heard. Often uh, at times to uh, at least reading it, you know, with nearly two millennia of hindsight, rather, rather funny results. One time, for example, wandering into a village of, of Greek, Greek speakers, Greek type people, preaching this gospel, preaching about all of this. He then, he works a miracle. And they try to call them by, by they try to claim them as the Greek gods. They call Saul or Paul Hermes, because he's the messenger. He's the one who speaks. He has another companion with him, a man named Barnabas. He's silent, and he's just there as an auxiliary and a helper. They call Barnabas Zeus, because he must be, you know, he's not speaking, because, you know, normally, you know, the head god doesn't speak directly to you. He speaks to an intermediary. Paul and Barnabas both, both are trying to you know, do everything and say, no, we are not gods. You know, Help us kind of. You know, Holy Spirit has fun sometimes, I guess. But they're beginning to go more and more. Saul and, and you know, Saul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas are going more and more to these Gentiles, these non-Jews. But there arises a question. What do they need to do if they're going to become a part of this ecclesia, this community of believers, this assembly of believers? What's the main symbol or, or ritual that Jews undergo at least male Jews undergo. It signify that they belong to their, to their community. Circumcision. Circumcision, right. 
The males reach a certain age and they are circumcised in the, the sign of Abraham and all the believers after him. Does this need to happen for these Gentiles as well? Who are uncut, at least on a spiritual basis? Do they need to follow the ways of everything that they understood from their own scriptures and all of that? All the laws, the commandments, and all those things. This is kind of where the narrative begins to stray from Peter more into, into Paul's territory. And it happens with this event known as the Council of Jerusalem. The various apostles gathered together, Peter and Paul in the same place, And they debate and argue over this. What they interpret, what they understand, what they have experienced, what has happened. What is going on? The decision that they come to, decision of the Council of Jerusalem, is that no, these new believers, these new followers of the way, these new Christians, they begin to be called Christians, Christianos, Christianoi. These new Christians do not need to be circumcised. They do not need to observe all of the various laws and commandments that are spelled out in the Torah and the prophets and, and all of that. One requirement they give to these Gentile Christians, one requirement to not eat of any meat offered, sacrificed to another God or an idol. So with this Council of Jerusalem, we begin to see the transition from kind of the time of Peter, the time of the, of, of the, Jew, the Judeans, the Jewish people, to transition to Paul in the time of the Gentiles, the non-Jews, the non-Judeans. to everyone else in the world. In going through, we see encounter multiple journeys of Paul and his companions around the Mediterranean. They go to modern day Turkey, they go to modern day Greece, modern day Lebanon, modern day Syria. Going out and back, sometimes out and back. These missionary journeys. You should see in your copy of the um, study Bible, you should see you, that should be one of the maps in there of the various missionary journeys of Paul. It might be in the midst of the Acts of the Apostles, it might be in the back. You know, look at your copy and see at the break. He's going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Paul gets done with his third, um, his third great missionary journey. He returns to Jerusalem. This is a few decades after he started. We're in probably the late fifties at this point. There's. The, church, the, the ecclesia, the church, 
reaches numerous areas, numerous peoples. But there's still trouble in the place where it started, in Jerusalem. Paul gets sucked into a quarrel between various Jewish crowds. They want him to, to rule and to decide one way or the other. He recognizes, though, that none of them really agree with him. So he tries to sway it all. And he does it in the, in the, way, the only way he knows how. He appealed to Caesar. Any Roman citizen, anyone who is an actual citizen of Rome, remember, not every person living is automatically made a citizen of the Roman Empire. They may be residents. Well, all of them are residents. That doesn't mean they are all citizens. Natural citizenship or natural born citizenship is a rather recent month innovation. But Paul is a Roman citizen. Well, Paul has, has gained Roman citizenship. And as part of that, a Roman citizen has the right to appeal their case to Caesar himself. And so Paul does that in the midst of this persecution, this last persecution, as recalled in the Acts. So Paul makes this appeal, which means he has to go to the great city. If you're going to appeal to Caesar, you got to go see the man. He ain't coming to you. So this begins the last journey of Paul, as recalled in the Acts of the Apostles. And he spends quite a few seasons. Remember, this, this is a time that the only, the fastest way to sail was by wind. And the winds change based on the season. And they're not going, you know, they, they, it's very expensive to hire slaves to row, especially if you're rowing against the wind. So more often than not, if you're trying to travel around the Mediterranean, it doesn't, it's not like a maybe one month journey. It might be a couple months. It might take half a year even. So Paul begins this journey, going through many of the places that he had visited and going beyond that. And during immense trials himself, he gets shipwrecked at one place. He's shipwrecked on the island of Malta. He's actually bit uh, or stung by a sort of scorpion. The non-Christian sailors, the non-believing sailors, are all like, well, this man's really unlucky. Not only is he, as soon as he gets to shore, he's stung, he's going to die. He doesn't die. Waves it off like it's nothing. But Paul eventually makes it to Rome. He makes it to the big city. Luke basically ends it on that cliffhanger. He basically ends it, like I said, about the year 62 or so, that Paul, he says, Paul is, is there preaching and helping the Christians in Rome for about two years. Paul just, and then Luke just ends it. So they're going, what happened? So the major takeaways that we ought to see in what, in what the Acts of the Apostles is, is showing us. First of all, of course, it is showing us the Acts of the Apostles, and it focuses on two. It focuses on Peter for about the first half till about chapter 15 or so, and then transitions to Paul, or Saul, as he used to be known. We see in this the transition. 
from an exclusively Jewish group, in the sense of that people, the people of Judea, to a group that's more, far more open, universal, to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. Not saying there aren't Jewish converts after this transition as well. The focus becomes on all these other people. Yeah. There's more than one race, more than one ethnicity living in the, in the place. We need to go and talk to all of them. So the work of the apostles of these two major figures, Peter in the beginning of the church, Paul in its, in its explosion, but also to see the action of what is called, known as the Holy Spirit. Or the Spirit of God. To be this, this gift, this force at work in the midst of the church. We saw it at the very beginning. Peter and the, uh, and the, and the other ten apostles. Especially with their successor. Preaching and teaching on that 50th day after Easter. We see it at work in the conversion of Saul, who will become known as Paul. From one who tried to squash this community to one who becomes its greatest proponent. But the Holy Spirit goes, you know, drives, emboldens these believers to go and become what they, to go and do what Jesus called them to do. Remember the end of the end of the Gospel of Matthew, going forth, baptize the nations, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teach all the nations. They can only do that with the aid of the Holy Spirit. Be emboldened on fire with this proclamation. But also to see the transit, to see that transition from merely kind of the, the perfection of Jewish observation, Jewish religious observation, to becoming a far more accommodating and accompanying faith. To say that Jesus has truly done something greater than all that came before us. And in fact, all that came before us pointed towards him. We're not called to merely just continue it. We're called to focus on the one who bridges this gap. Jesus the Christ. This then is how Luke concludes his narrative. He doesn't necessarily conclude it with the gospel that he writes. He concludes it here. Why does it seem he leaves it on a cliffhanger? Because the rest of his writers, his audience, knows what happens. What that is, we'll look at and talk about a little bit as we look next session into the letters, at least an overview of the epistles and the letters. For now, comments, questions? Um, does this mean that Paul became the perfect apostle then? Somewhat. He calls himself an apostle, but not as, in, a, in a certain sense, yes, like a, as a 13. More as, more as a saint calling himself an apostle to the Gentiles. 
that becomes like his, like he, he says at one point in kind of meeting with Peter, Council Jerusalem, you deal with the Jews, with our people, I'll go to everybody else. So yes, they are sent to everybody, but Paul in a particular way is sent, goes forth, goes out to bring about the, the welcoming of all peoples into this assembly. The answer right? Yes. Right. Other comments, thoughts, questions? All right. We'll pause it there. And then we'll discuss next time, next session, about all the various letters and epistles.